Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very delighted to be uh, moderating this panel on regional uh, regulatory convergence. Since the global financial crisis, I think it's been recognized globally that regulation is the third arm of economic policymaking, in, it, in addition to the traditional tools of fiscal and monetary policy. There's also been a recognition that we need to have regulatory rules to be harmonized across regions and jurisdictions in order to prevent things like regulatory arbitrage and race to the bottom. So in this panel, in this session, we'll be discussing these issues from a regional perspective. And we are very, very fortunate to have a very distinguished panel to discuss these issues. We have the governors of the most important central banks in this region. Um, the governors need very little in terms of introduction, but I'll do that very quickly. To my direct left is Dr. Ahmed Al Khalifi, the, gover the governor of the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority. To his left is Dr. Mohammed Al Hashim, governor of the Central Bank of Kuwait. To his left is Governor Mubarak Al Mansouri, governor of the Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates. And to the far left is Governor Tarak Amr, governor of the Central Bank of Egypt. Your Excellencies, thank you very much for joining this panel. Now let's go, <coughs> excuse me, let's go straight into the topic of the panel, which is regulatory convergence. I'd like to ask each of you, probably beginning with Governor Amr, on why you think regulatory convergence across this region is important, and what kind of requirements your cu current regulatory framework provide, how does it provide the basis for convergence across jurisdictions? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored with my friends and colleagues and partners, the uh, honorable governors, and with all the audience here. I think there has been a level of convergence, uh, a level of uh, regulatory harmonization that has been taking place. And it's been led primarily by the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Board, etc. And I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, development and regulation that we have in common so far. But we have to understand something we need to look uh, a little bit backwards. Because central banks at the front, uh, behind them, there is a lot of factors. Sociopolitical forces, interest groups, business communities, their own markets, and uh, their history. And we have to understand that uh, development of regulation and independence of central banks, it is not, uh, is, is not an absolute matter. Uh, it is a factor of an environment. And you, if you have to realize that the development of independence of central banks, uh, if you look in history, it has been uh, the empowerment of central banks came more when crisis took place in the West, uh, in the East, etc. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the empowerment of central banks uh, is an evolution process. And, uh, the, and it has to be, uh, uh, it has to be transformed and uh, bought by, by the, the environment and the community at large. So this is uh, a process that we uh, are working on and we are inside. But we cannot say today that, but in order for uh, uh, we have convergence, we need to have a, a lot of uniformity in our different markets. What we are doing now is that we are trying in our own markets to develop, first we were trying to get out and ensure financial stability after a, a series of crises that affected the world and spilled over on us. So we were having, uh, doing our own homeworks inside our markets. In Egypt, the last two years, we were busy fixing monetary policy, fixing regulation, fixing our fiscal, and uh, trying to restore market confidence. So uh, this is a, a process that, uh, that, uh, that uh, goes on for a long period of time. 
and it's a matter of communication with uh, with the with other uh, regions. Uh, uh, also, there are other factors involved. Is that to have monetary policy also affect regulations, and regulations affect monetary policy. And there are different regimes. You have regimes where regulators are independent, separate institutions, like in the UK. Uh, we, from our experience, uh, our regulator being part of our, the central bank helped us much uh, managing the crisis because you cannot disintegrate both. And there is implications and reflections from both. Uh, also, you have the fiscal positions of different uh, constituencies. And also, you have, uh, the, ability, you have the factor to uh, being able to coordinate with other regulators. Because it's not just about central banks. You have the capital markets. Mm -hmm. And you have other large conglomerates in your uh, markets. And uh, there are gaps. And we continue to work on these gaps. Thank you. Sounds good. So, Governor Mansouri, would you like to give us the perspective from the United Arab Emirates? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, we at the UAE, uh, you know, play a greater uh, uh, emphasis on making sure that, you know, we always upgrade our regulations to be uh, uh, in common with best practices like the Basel, uh, the Financial Stability Board, OECD, among others. And I think, uh, as you have seen in the newspaper yesterday, UAE uh, ranked number one in 50 indicators. So uh, uh, this puts uh, more, actually, uh, a challenge on us as regulators, really, to converge. I think there is no uh, uh, option but to converge with international standards as we are becoming more and more open. Uh, and we want to be, as a UAE, uh, a hub, a global hub now. We want to move from a regional hub to be a global hub with these initiatives, what we heard today from the previous speakers. So there is, uh, there is a lot upon us, really, to uh, make sure that we always upgrade and benchmark our uh, regulations to best practices. Sounds good. So no option but to converge. Is that also the view from the Central Bank of Kuwait, Dr. Yes. Hashem? Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, it is very critical, we believe, in convergence and harmonization among regulators because uh, we think uh, it is an uh, essential for creating a level playing field that minimizes economic risks and at the same time reduce opportunities, as you mentioned at the beginning, reduce opportunities of regulatory arbitrage. And I think uh, Basel uh, package, Basel III reforms, is, is, is a very good case, an example of harmonization and regulation worldwide. But that depends on other factors as well, like the consistency and timely implementation and the minimization of national discretion in the implementation of uh, uh, Basel III reforms. Uh, Basel, III, Basel III reforms, of course, doesn't uh, uh, stop at capital adequacy. It also includes other uh, important macroprudential regulation like uh, liquidity measures and leverage ratios, and also the forward-looking uh, perspective of risk management. And that's all has been uh, implemented, in fact, uh, in Kuwait. Kuwait was one of the uh, early countries to implement Basel III reforms, the whole package, uh, and our banks are doing very well in terms of uh, compliance. Sounds good. Dr. Khalifi, what's the view from well, Sam? Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, briefly, uh, my colleagues already covered uh, the topic very well. Uh, definitely, the convergence is highly needed in, into the market. Uh, you want to avoid, really, the gaps. You want to avoid the arbitrage. Arbitraging was one of the reasons behind the crisis, as you uh, can tell. Uh, in addition to that, for market analysts like you, you want to compare apples to apples. So you want really the markets uh, implementing the same standards. I think we will converge by default if we all apply the same uh, rules uh, coming from the same standard setters uh, globally. Uh, that's uh, in Can a nutshell. Can I just add um, yes, of that uh, we are um, 
in terms of convergence we are discussing among uh, GCC governors and also Arab governors. So we have forums to discuss these and make sure that also we are aligned among ourselves. Sounds, sounds very good. So you mentioned gaps, uh, Governor Amin mentioned the history. Let's put them together and talk about uh, regulation going forward. Do you, Governor Amr, do you identify, do you have any gaps that you can identify in your current regulatory framework that you'd like to fill that will shape your regulatory agenda going forward? Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. We have uh, a long way to go, but uh, uh, we, we, once you identify mm. what, uh, where you're short, uh, I think this is uh, a very good start at the very good beginning. We have uh, different regulators, and we have been uh, signing protocols with the capital markets regulator. Uh, we have looked at our <clears throat> the legislation that governs banking in, in Egypt, and we found that it needs complete revamp. And we have, uh, we're, we're almost done with the new banking law, uh, working with international legal consultants and financial consultants and uh, auditing companies, etc. Uh, it is important to bring the market and its awareness uh, uh, to where uh, the international and the globe is, is going. And this needs a lot of education to our communities internally. This is not, e it's not just uh, doing another law. You have a parliament, you have to convince them, you have the community, you have the media. You have the young people, you have Facebook, and uh, it's quite a challenging for regulators today. Mm -hmm. And uh, our community, Egypt, is a 7,000 years old country. So change is not really something that is uh, very, uh, very attractive. But <clears throat> we, we are putting a new law to implement a very uh, sharp and crisp governance uh, into the banking system to increase competitiveness. Uh, we don't uh, want people to feel relaxed in the banking system because our objective out of regulation is not to just protect financial stability uh, by uh, defend financial stability by closing uh, the windows and by putting controls. Uh, the objective is to be able to uh, achieve financial stability by uh, bringing financial intermediation to the market in a real way. Because historically, banks used to bank with the rich, used to bank with the big corporations. No, today, there is different concepts. The concept of reaching out to the community, bringing funding to the community, and investing in the human brain. And I said this before, rather than investing in you know, fixed assets, it is more important to develop the community and being able to tap the most precious resource in your communities. So this is a different concept of banking and things are changing very quickly and we are using and riding financial technology to, which facilitates this for us very much. So there is a lot happening uh, anyway. I don't want to take more time. <laughs> Governor Mansouri, you, you mentioned that you, uh, you meet other central bank governors in forums. Do these forums help you identify the gaps and set your agenda going forward to achieve regulatory convergence? Definitely. Uh, I think we, we have an ongoing uh, discussion about what is uh, important for our regions. And I would like to stress that uh, uh, the more we go into uh, international benchmarks, as uh, uh, my, my colleague mentioned, there's a lot to fix or to improve, which is uh, we have started in the UE. Uh, it is mainly about risk management, compliance, governance. So the more you move towards international benchmarks, which is actually lowering the capital adequacy requirement, because we're, where we are now in terms of uh, the status quo is, is, is higher because, you know, uh, we would like our banks, and this is by, it's not by design, it's by their, uh, by their decision to keep it at a high level mm -hmm. to make sure that they have uh, the strength. So the moment you move uh, these uh, ratios lower, you want to make sure other controls are in place. Uh, because there is no point uh, that they continue 
uh, you know, having uh, capital adequacy in the case of UAE, it's about 18.9%, uh, while uh, uh, the, the regulation says only 12%. So that is good in, in, uh, during crisis. However, uh, there is, you know, a cost-benefit analysis that, you know, uh, banks, I'm sure, uh, looking at. Uh, as for the central bank, uh, we are pushing uh, on this agenda uh, to make sure that our banks uh, continue to be uh, improved, continue to be resi resilient, continue to be doing business cross-border, mm -hmm. and continue to be also cognizant of the fact that new technologies now are changing the, the scene, which is, I think, in the next two to three years, we will see a lot of uh, new technologies. Uh, and I, uh, I, I listened today to some of the new technologies, like you know, uh, uh, the, the FinTech-related blockchain, uh, DLT, and cryptocurrency. I think the underlying uh, technology is really beneficial for our sector whereby you know could be utilized because now the customers are used to uh, using their smartphones so they want things as fast as possible so these technologies will enable banks to to really uh, conduct their affairs in a more efficient way i give you one example now in some of the banks uh, uh, which you know we we have started implementing the national id you can they can upload your bank accounts by putting your, you know, your fingerprint. So that is the way we are going uh, in, in the financial sector. Technology has to really uh, facilitate uh, doing business across the board. Sure, so technology is obviously a big issue and how it challenges regulation going forward. We'll discuss this in a bit. But Dr. al Hashul, just uh, back to you. So in terms of um, the gaps that you see uh, from your perspective in the Central Bank of Kuwait, where do you see the biggest gap? Well, if you, if you speak about gaps in harmonization and convergence, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the, in my opinion, the most important and critical gap is the consistent, effective, and timely implementation of the standards that are accepted worldwide or best practices. So that's the most important one that we have to cover. But if speaking of gaps in regulations, uh, sky's the limit. This doesn't mean for us as a regulator to continue to tighten the screws and uh, increase our uh, uh, stringent regulations. Of course, the higher the better is not correct. The higher in terms of capital adequacy or liquidity, this is not correct. This will lead definitely to inefficiencies. So it is a matter of, of an art that is based on science. You have to, as a regulator, you have to strike a balance. When you regulate an institution, you have to put in yourself in their places and being effective in serving the community and serving the whole economy. And here you have to go back and see and observe your objective. What is your objective as, a, as an institution within that setup in that country? Your objective, your ultimate objective is to increase and enhance the welfare of the society, enhance and increase prosperity for the whole community. And to do that, you need a, a, a necessary but not sufficient condition is financial stability and monetary stability. For, for finance, speaking of regulation, then let's speak about financial stability. To achieve financial stability, you need the right macroprudential policy, a balanced, effective, and efficient regulation that regulates the institutions, ensures the safety, but at the same time do not stifle innovation or put uh, impediments and obstacles uh, in the face of, uh, of bankers or uh, financial institutions in, in their job in intermediating and fin providing funds for the productive uh, sectors in the economy. So it's very uh, critical for us, and we have to be very delicate in, in, in striking uh, that balance. So it's uh, uh, sky's the limit, as I said, but if we implement the right regulation, if we build our capacity, if we focus more on implementation and supervision and enforcement of what we have issued, which is different, completely different from regulations. So we have to differentiate between supervision and regulation. If we do that in a balanced and efficient way, I think you will achieve financial stability, which will be a conducive for inclusive growth and would create jobs for, for 
your citizens and ultimately uh, uh, prosperity of the society. So that's very interesting. Financial stability does not mean suffocating the economy with of course ever not. higher regulatory to tools. And, and convergence, if anything, could mean even more relaxed capitalization ratio, as, as uh, Governor Mansour has mentioned. Is also the view from Saudi Arabia, or is it well, things uh, are different there? I kind of agree with uh, Governor al Hashel. Uh, there is no perfection point, by the way, when it comes to regulation. And if you go and ask the banking community, uh, they are fed up with more regulation. <laughs> And, uh, but uh, that's why we have, in, in order to close the gaps, that's what we, why we have puzzle one, two, three. Uh, but it looks like the regulators now also uh, are convinced that puzzle three will be the ultimate uh, destination. At least we, there is no talk about puzzle four, which is good, uh, by the way. Uh, gaps will emerge. And the unfortunate, unfortunate, unfortunate thing that you cannot discover the gaps until late. And so I cannot tell you really if there are gaps, but if there are gaps, definitely will be closed. Uh, but for me, I'm uh, fully convinced that the current regulations are uh, sufficient to deal with the gaps. Sounds good. So this region has uh, benefited a great deal, and, and we'll, st we'll, we'll stick with you, Dr. Khalifi, has benefited a great deal from a large inflow of capital from outside the region. Uh, obviously, that capital came, and that's useful for multiple things in the region, but it also comes with risks, both on the way in, but also in particular if there is a, a risk of a sudden reversal of that capital. Can regulation play any role to minimize this risk, or is it completely a different game? Well, uh, speaking of uh, the Saudi market, we have complete uh, freedom of movement of capital in and out. And we never thought about uh, regulating the capital. We never think that regulation will, be, uh, will take care of capital uh, or to put capital control. Uh, I think, again, it was mentioned by the governor, Hash, that fundamentals are uh, very important, economic fundamentals. Yeah. And that's what we need really to put in place in order to attract uh, more capital flows. And uh, to deter any movement, large movement, I'm talking about large movement of capital uh, outflow. Uh, of course, uh, let's not forget that structural changes are very important, and specifically the financial markets, and that's what we need in our area, I'm in Saudi Arabia and in the rest of uh, the markets in the region. Uh, we need to deepen uh, our markets, really, and we need to put more transparency and more uh, also discipline. Uh, and discipline and the transparency, by the way, we need it also more in the fiscal side. That's what we had in the last two years in Saudi Arabia as well. Uh, moreover, is of course, and more related is more and closer, I would say, not more, closer macro prudential uh, measures and monitoring. And again, that's what we do in SAMA. If you ask any uh, bank uh, in SAMA, they will tell you uh, SAMA is a conservative. Uh, in fact, we uh, deny that and we say, no, we are not conservative, but we are closely monitoring the situation. And luckily, uh, so far, uh, we are uh, succeeding in that. Term. Dr. Hashid, can re regulation play any role in minimizing of the course. risk of inflows uh, and outflows? Of course, but I think uh, we have to take a holistic uh, and uh, out, uh, look outside the box. You have to look and dig deep into the fundamentals of, of, your, of your question and the source of those inflows. Inflows, capital inflows are good for the economy if they, it depends on many factors, if they stimulate the economy, if they uh, smooth uh, income of consumers, if they finance investments, then they would be uh, uh, of an added value to the macroeconomic picture. So it depends on the, the size, it depends on the destination of those funds, it depends on the duration, and it depends on stability. At least four elements I can identify now that uh, tell you about uh, the, the benefit that you may, can gain out of, of capital inflows. If the, if, there, of those, if, if the capital is going to productive investments and productive sectors in the economy, and stays for long, then it's beneficial for the economy. So you have to dig deep and see where's capital coming from and where's it going to. Uh, back to your question, 
in our toolbox as a central bank plus regulator, you have uh, tools in your monetary policy, and there you can do capital controls, which is I'm not advocating, but you, you have that tool, and you have also macro prudential as a regulator. You have the macro prudential tools, and the macro prudential tools there you can control the the sectors that goes that capital goes to. If if you have, for instance, if you have loan to deposit ratios, if you have loan to value ratios, if you have uh, uh, ratios like um, liquidity and capital adequacy ratios, uh, those measures would minimize, if they are set correctly, in an efficient, again, way, and in a prudent way, then they will deter the inflow at the first place. And then you're not worrying about that hot money to be reversed and to leave the economy and lead to uh, disturbance in, in, the, in the economy. So the, I think uh, before <coughs> thinking of reversal of capital, is that when inflows come to the economy, you have to ensure that uh, those capital, those funds, are going to the right sectors in the economy, well utilized, benefit, beneficial for the whole com community and investment uh, climate, and then if, if they are invested correctly and in a safe way, then you're not worried about the reversal of those uh, funds later on. Absolutely. L inflows are also risky in the same way that outflows are. Uh, Governor Mansouri, uh, what's your view from the UAE? Does, is regulation part of the toolbox to minimize the risk of capital flight? I, I think uh, the UAE has, has learned the lesson from the last financial crisis. And as a result, we have developed our regulations so that, you know, there isn't that excessive exposure or inflow into certain sectors, i.e. we have defined what are the maximum sector exposure. We have defined LTVs. Uh, we have defined uh, maximum uh, burden ratios. So all these contribute to stability. The, all these contribute to uh, um, a well-designed uh, uh, capital flow. Uh, to make sure that the, 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 the flow of capital is, as, as uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Governor Khalifi mentioned, we are uh, a free inflow and outflow uh, of capital country. Uh, and we, we are um, uh, uh, fixed with the dollar in terms of uh, currency. So our options are limited, which means we have to revert to those macro prudential tools. And also now there is, as part of the Basel III, uh, is the, what we call the counter-cyclical buffers, mm -hmm. where you set at zero to uh, a percentage based on the evolution of uh, the economic growth. Okay, that's very interesting. So Governor Amr, Egypt has been a huge beneficiary of uh, capital inflows since the uh, float of the currency in November 2016. Now you started your uh, monetary easing cycle, uh, with a 100 basis point rate cut in your last meeting. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you could use regulatory tools in order to prevent uh, the capital flight if that risk materializes at some point? Or are you going to not use these types of tools at all? Well, like the governors were saying, that uh, we, look, we work on the fundamentals. Mm. Okay? We, and, th and that's what is sustainable. Okay? Uh, matters in the international market change from one week to another, and they reverse. We've experienced over the years capital flight, and then after one week, they go back, you know. You cannot, uh, you have to work on the fundamentals, and this region has a, a very solid track record. This region is quite diverse. Uh, it's... Uh, 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 it has a diverse, diverse economies. Uh, its economic growth levels over the years compared to other regions has been uh, on top. Uh, its balance of payments figures and performance has been very good. Its inflation levels has been, comparatively speaking, with the, with the world stable and, uh, uh, and low. Um, it's, uh, it's fiscal situations, etc. So this region stands out and it, uh, this region uh, did not default. This region has a very uh, uh, strong uh, performance record. Uh, and um, uh, it continues to be uh, dynamic. And in terms of regulations, uh, we are all there uh, in terms of 
Basel 1, Basel 2, Basel 100. But we, like uh, the governors were saying, we are trying to, uh, we're not trying to adopt and imitate. We're trying to understand what's our, what's our mission. And our mission is to make sure that these markets uh, are able to uh, unlock their potential. So regulations are not uh, controlling and inhibiting and hindering. It, they have to be enabling. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So I think we'll have some time to take questions from the audience. Please raise your hand. I think there are mics floating around. We'll take three questions and allow the Excellency, the governors, to answer them. Um, this gentleman over here. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, and good, uh, good morning to all your excellencies. Uh, my name is Nicholas Gilani. I have a question. Except for the government of Kuwait, uh, the UAE and Saudi uh, exchange rates against the dollar are pegged. I'm not so sure about Egypt. The United States rate of inflationary pressures is upward, and the Fed is increasing uh, the rates, especially with Janet uh, Yellen leaving. How do, do you? Would you foresee some sort of a pressure on the pegged currencies of UAE and Saudi? Thank you. Okay. Uh, two more questions we could take. Uh, please raise your hand if there are any. There's one there. There is, yeah. In the back. And there's one at the back. So this gentleman here and this gentleman at the back. We'll start there. This is to, you know, all their excellencies, the governors. Uh, in terms of uh, risk recognition, particularly credit risk uh, and market risks, how comfortable are you with the situation that's prevailing? Because it's, it's, a, it's a movable feast. Uh, just wanted to get your views. Okay, and the gentleman at the back. Thank you, Brian Mascala from Barclays. Um, the regulatory environment over the last six or eight years has evolved in a very benign international environment, low international rates, uh, large capital inflows. Uh, now Basel III is coming, the Fed is hiking, the world may be changing. So how are you looking at changes in your own Im regulatory environment with all these changes? Okay. So we have three questions. I'll ask each of the governors to uh, answer any of them. And I'll add one more question on technology because technology seems to be attracting a lot of attention. Is technology making regulation? easier or more difficult? Uh, is it creating hindrances, increasing financial inclusion? I'll start with Dr. Khalifi. So we have a question on the Fed rate hike and the impact on the PEG, credit risk, and change in regulations. No, um, with regard to the exchange rate arrangements that we are following, obviously uh, the gentleman uh, knows the situation that we are pegged to the dollar. And uh, absolutely we are uh, following the developments in the market, particularly the Fed moves. So whenever the moves uh, happen from the Fed, we still have enough tools to deal with it. In addition to the fundamentals that we talked about earlier. By the way, in uh, early 16, the fundamentals were uh, probably weaker than what we have right now, particularly in the oil market. So the pressure would be much less on okay. us. Uh, any word on technology at all? Uh, I don't know what you mean by technology. Uh, technology defini definitely is uh, disturbing uh, our, uh, I mean, uh, I would say our, our behavior in the, as central bankers, usually we, know we want to uh, be uh, traditional, but unfortunately we cannot be. Uh, so we want really to be ahead of the curve all the time. And we want really to employ the technology, particularly in the payment system. And that's what we do in, in Saudi Arabia. Since early uh, 80s, we are adopting the latest in the technology. That's why we also uh, recently began to uh, use the blockchain, uh, whether uh, in uh, collaboration with the United Arab Emirates Central Bank right now, we are talking about it, or uh, uh, internally. Okay, that's very interesting, Dr. Lash. Well, uh, in our situation in Kuwait, as you know, our FX regime, uh, our currency is pegged to a basket of currencies, major currencies that we have uh, trade and financial relationships with. And that gave us a relative flexibility and it served us uh, very well during the past uh, decades. Uh, in fact, uh, we exercised that relative flexibility in the past two hikes from the Fed back in June and December. 2017, in which we did not increase our policy rate 
uh, in order not to increase the cost of borrowing. At a time when you want to stimulate the economy and encourage private sector participation and provide funds to SMEs and other corporate and consumers as well. But at the same time, you have a daunting task of maintaining the attractiveness of your currency and maintain a positive spread in favor of your currency compared to the major and most important currency, uh, namely the US dollars. And to achieve that objective, which is conflicting with the previous objective, and this is the dilemma, to achieve that obje objective, we increased our yield curve using our instruments, CBK instruments, as well as the treasury instruments, in order to provide and pay more to, to buyers, namely the banks, uh, buyers of our instruments and treasury instruments, and give them uh, enough room in terms of profits and incentives to pay higher to depositors. By doing that, combining these two instruments within our monetary policy tools, we allowed, as I said, to provide funds, hopefully with relatively cheaper uh, cost of funds to, to borrowers, and at the same time, uh, allow banks to pay higher rates to depositors in order to maintain the attractiveness of our KD and maintain funds locally and avoid any migration of capital. In terms of technology, technology is the future, no question about it. And we have to be proactive, not only reactive to that. We have to build our capacity. I don't blame the audience when they say a high percentage on the question about the mindset of regulators. Indeed, that's not an easy thing to do. But it is a must that we have to be conducive for that. We have to allow for it, and it's the, it's the future. Unfortunately, for us, it doesn't come a plain vanilla one uh, way uh, benefits. No, there is a cost benefit. It comes with, with risks and bundles. And we have, to, uh, we have to, do, to do by mandate, according to our mandate that I mentioned of ensuring financial stability and monetary stability, you have to, if, if you cannot avoid the risks, then you have to manage and mitigate those risks. And all, because you are, at the end of the day, you are responsible for the safety and providing convenient product and service, but at the same time safe to the society. Because if there is anything happen, if things turn south, then you, people will be blaming you, and you'll be responsible for any hazardous or damage that happened to the trust or to the financial, uh, the whole welfare of the society. Sure. Governor Mansouri, do you have a view on any of the questions on credit risk, on the PEG, on technology? Uh, let me take the credit uh, risk first, uh, maybe uh, uh, because this is a, a new phenomenon in UAE in terms of how banks are uh, giving uh, credit, uh, which has uh, uh, improved uh, tremendously uh, recently due to the uh, Etihad Credit Bureau. So this has really contributed to uh, uh, better credits which in, in essence contributes to a lower cost of capital because uh, different people will, uh, will get different uh, rates based on their uh, profiles. So there is a positive uh, uh, trend there. When it comes to uh, 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 the fixed rate uh, regime uh, to the dollar, uh, uh, this has benefited, uh, I think, the region and UAE uh, in specific over the years. Uh, in terms of uh, our uh, stand on that, uh, uh, that's uh, continuing. There is no change. Um, inflation, I think it was mentioned, inflation. Uh, inflation is still benign in the UAE. I think uh, we recorded or we are estimating at 1.8% for uh, 2017. Um, in terms of, I don't remember the question over there, but I'll uh, talk about technology or fintech. I agree with you, Boali, we don't understand fintech as regulators. <laughs> However, if you don't understand something, you don't jump into it. <laughs> so that's one. Uh, but I think uh, uh, cyber crime should be highlighted because this is the more we digitize, the more we go digital, we need to be careful about that. And I, I know there are a lot of efforts in, into that direction. It might help us as regulators in terms of technology because uh, I give you one example, uh, and, and that's maybe more relevant to people who are investing. Uh, now you could get market pulse 
on the spot rather than waiting for the Statistics Bureau to give you a report at the end of three months. This makes a huge difference in, in the decision making, whether it's a central bank or an investor. Absolutely. So Governor Amr, I guess the <coughs> question on the peg is not really relevant to yeah. you. Let me ask you about technology. Let me ask you about something particular in technology because we covered different dimensions of it, but there's a, an element that everyone's interested in, although this audience seems to be skeptical about, which is Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. What is the view on this? Well, what we're doing on technology is that we created uh, a fintech uh, division at the central bank uh, to try and understand what's going on. And uh, our view is that we have to embrace what's happening and be partner within this. Uh, so what we're, what we're doing is that we're communicating now with uh, the entrepreneurs and the innovators and the players in this industry uh, and trying to see the opportunities and work together with them. Um, uh, we believe that uh, the environment is changing very quickly and technology is changing a lot of things and we have, we cannot keep defending our position in terms of the classical uh, banking models that we had. Uh, I'm concerned about this intermediation of the banks uh, and it is very important. So what we're doing, we're bringing, raising the awareness of the banking system and asking them to get involved and uh, be part of it. Uh, of course, uh, the concern that we, what, what we need our eyes to be very open in terms of uh, the risks, okay? And uh, what we need to do is that uh, we are using the specialists of this industry. We are using the specialists and the experts and the best experts. And we are uh, walking in this direction uh, as we go slowly. In terms of the credit risk, I'd like also to give a course, comment yes. because <clears throat> in Egypt, uh, 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 the credit risk uh, is good uh, because of a number of factors. Uh, first, because of uh, the levels of growth. Uh, second, the size of uh, the economy and the market. Uh, uh, corporates are growing very fast. They're making a lot of profits. So uh, this, of course, is the best protection in terms of credit risk. But also, uh, the other thing is that uh, both borrowers and lenders, <coughs> they learned a lesson from non-performing loans. Today, we have 5% Non-performing loans is the, uh, in the banking system is 5%. Yes. So, and this, of course, is, uh, is, is very good. So uh, the credit risk is not a concern anymore. I think everybody, the level of awareness has really risen uh, tremendously. Well, fascinating discussion. I'd love to continue this, but I'm afraid we'll run out of time. Uh, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for a very insightful and informative session. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. Thank you.